Welcome to CSS Chapter 2, The Box Model and Positioning. In this screencast, we're going to learn what the CSS box model is, and we're going to learn how to position elements on a web page. Let's get started. In order to understand how elements behave in CSS, first you must understand the box model. For display purposes, every HTML element is considered to be a rectangular box surrounded by padding, a border if you like, and a margin. I'll include a link to this example that you see in front of you beneath the video so you can follow along. Using padding, borders, and margins allows us to give our elements a little bit of breathing room on the page. Generally speaking, we don't want all of our elements butting up exactly flush with each other. The red area you see represents your content and the exact size it appears on a page. This content right here, it could be a paragraph, an image, a div, a list, whatever this element is, the exact space it occupies is represented by this red box. The padding represents the area between the content and the border that exists around it. It extends the area of the content. If you were to put a background color on your content, well, like this red color right here, this padding area would actually be the same background color. The border is exactly that. It's a border surrounding an HTML element. It isn't necessary to place a visible border around each and every element but the border represents the outer edge of the visible content box, including the padding. This border extends the padding area and it can be a solid color, it can be a dashed line, it can be a dotted line, it can also be an image too. And you can declare this using CSS. For this example, let's just say there is a border here around this red content box that is black and 10 pixels wide. This border has effectively extended the size of this element by 10 pixels all around. And lastly, there's margin. Margin exists outside of the element and it is empty and transparent space that is used to separate this content from its neighbors. One way I like to think of margin is the personal space surrounding the content. All of these spacing properties extend and increase the space that our content occupies on our page. When we add padding, borders, and margins, our elements grow. Let's take another look in depth. Here in this example, I'd like to demonstrate in detail exactly how padding, borders, and margin increase the size of an element. Here we have some content. It's a div with something inside it. Text, an image, it doesn't really matter what. This div is exactly 200 pixels wide by 50 pixels tall. It has a background color of light blue, and I'd like to apply some CSS styles to add some space around it in our layout. First, I'd like to add some padding. The padding has extended the light blue background of our div. The content itself is still contained inside its original content box of 50 pixels by 200 pixels, but the padding gives us some space inside the border which I'd like to make five pixels thick and light gray. This border has also extended the size of our element by five pixels all around. Now we can start to see our element take shape. I still want to add some space surrounding it on the outside so it doesn't appear flush with the element next to it. I want to add some space of 20 pixels around the outside to separate it from the other elements on the page. When we started, our div was once only 200 pixels wide and 50 pixels tall. After adding our padding, borders, and margin, it now occupies a bit more space on this page. Let's do some math to see how much more space it's taking up. First, we'll start with the original dimensions of 200 by 50. 
let's add 10 pixels on all sides for padding and five pixels on all sides for the border and 20 pixels on all sides for the margin. Add everything up, accounting for all four sides of the box. And we now have an element that is taking up 270 pixels in width by 120 pixels in height. It is worth mentioning that the sizes I've laid out here can be declared in units other than pixels. I could have used percentage as well, which would have been interpreted based upon the size of the parent element or the parent node. When we're talking about declaring padding and margins and borders and percentages, it would have been based upon the size of the original content box, which is 200 by 50. Uh, the original content box being the parent node, just a hint. Um, there are even more units I could have used, such as M's, REMs, or points. Refer to CSS documentation on how setting sizes using these other units will work. So let's move on to CSS positioning. Let's jump way ahead and talk about one of the most complicated and often misunderstood CSS concepts, positioning. In this example, I'm back at the Bootcamp Coder student website in Class Materials Week 1, CSS Box Model and Positioning. I'll add a link beneath this video so you can follow along. CSS positioning can frustrate even experienced web designers and developers, so let's take a plunge into the deep end of CSS now. In order to know how to use CSS effectively for page layout, you've got to understand how the browser positions page elements. There is a lot of power that CSS can offer you when it comes to laying out and positioning elements on a page. You can declare positioning for an element by using the position property in CSS. There are four methods of positioning elements using the position property that I'll demonstrate using the colored boxes on this page. I encourage you to use the sample page to mess around using DevTools yourself. We're going to be talking about position static, position relative, position absolute, and position fixed. Here we see four colored boxes, and they are all placed within a container div, which is the large gray box they are sitting within. Right now, all of these boxes are position static, which is by default. This means these elements are sitting where they normally would in our page according to how they are laid out in our HTML. Normally, you wouldn't have to specify position static unless you needed to override a positioning rule that's been already set. I'm going to open up DevTools now and demonstrate how positioning works. Each of these boxes has an ID. And using the ID, I'm going to target one of them and position it around the page. I think I'm going to choose box two to be my victim. I've highlighted box two here in the HTML panel. And if I look over to the right in the CSS panel, I can see its ID here, box two. If I specify position relative, I can then use the top, bottom, left, and right properties to move this box relative to where it is right now. Let's move it over to the right 40 pixels and down 20 pixels. Notice that there's now empty space where box two was just a moment ago and neither box one nor box three shifted when we moved box two. That's because box two still occupies its original space here on the page, virtually speaking, even though we moved it on the screen. Now, if we set the position to absolute, let's see what happens. Box two is now removed from its original place on the page and placed exactly where we tell it to go. Let's move box two to the right top hand, the top right hand corner of this page. Let's set top to zero 
and right to zero. Notice that this time, the other boxes surrounding box two shifted when we moved it. You can see that box three moved up since box two is no longer there. Now, I see that using position absolute will allow me to move box two relative to the browser window itself as a whole. But what I wanna do now is to position box two relative to its container box right here. Now let's go back to the beginning. I'm going to refresh the page and reset these styles that we've just set in DevTools. Now, if we go into the containing element and we give it a position of relative, and if we go back into box two and give it a position of absolute, I can position box two relative to its container. Let's put it up here in the top right hand corner. I'll use the top property and set that to zero. I see it's moved to the top and I'll select the right property and move that to zero as well. So instead of moving box two to the upper right hand corner of the page as a whole, I've moved it absolutely relative to its containing element. Another way to position an element is using position fixed. This affixes an element in place and it won't move even if you scroll down the page. Let's try this with box two. I'm going to set the position to fixed and let's put it at the bottom of the page. I think this will demonstrate a little bit better about how this works. And here we see box two is stuck right down here in the lower right hand corner. And even if I scroll up and down, it's not going anywhere. Use the sample page to play around with CSS positioning rules. Please keep in mind that using CSS positioning is not a recommended way to lay out all of your elements on a web page. Use CSS positioning rules sparingly, if at all. It's important to understand what's going on in your browser regarding positioning, but there are much cleaner, much more efficient, and less buggy ways to lay out elements on a page than using these positioning rules we've demonstrated. In practice, we'll actually be using a fluid grid system built into the Bootstrap front-end framework to lay out the elements on our pages, but more on that later. Let's move ahead. Another way of affecting the layout of page elements is using the CSS float property. Using float, we can push an element to the left or to the right inside its container, allowing other elements, such as text, to wrap around it. This is typically used to wrap text around an image, for example, and you can see that's what we've done to box one over here. When it comes to positioning page elements, there are typically much better ways of laying out things rather than floating them, with perhaps the one common exception of wrapping text around an image. We can see here what happens when we float box one over to the right. The surrounding text looks okay, but the elements below are kind of messed up. Box one is overlapping box two, and it's very typical when we start floating elements around other elements that the layout can get a little messy. In order to correct this, we must clear the float so the rest of the elements will fall into place correctly. There is an old and well-established CSS hack called ClearFix that specifically addresses this issue. This is typically done by placing an empty HTML element, such as a div or a break, or sometimes even a horizontal rule, after the floated elements and applying the CSS property of clear both to it. I'm going to edit this HTML code live in DevTools and demonstrate the clear fix hack in action. In my CSS file, I've already declared a rule of clear both that will be applied to any element with a class of clear. If I right click on my container up here and select edit as HTML from the menu, I can edit this HTML here in DevTools. What I'm going to do is I'm going to place a BR tag 
with a class of clear beneath the last floated element, which in this case is going to be this paragraph, which is wrapping around box one. I'm going to click out of my HTML. Now I see that box two is positioned as it should be. If you ever see a div or other element with a class of clear or clear fix in any HTML code, this is typically what's happening. You can have a safe bet that the clear fix hack is an action there. If you plan on implementing floats in your pages, become familiar with the clear fix hack. I've included a link below this video for further reading about clear fix and different ways to implement it. And finally, I'm going to very briefly cover a brand new CSS positioning technique called Flexbox. Flexbox stands for Flexible Box, and it provides us with a brand new and powerful way to lay out and align HTML elements on our pages. These pink boxes have all been lined up within their container using Flexbox. There's no floating or old school CSS positioning going on here at all. First, let's notice the display property on the parent container has been set to display flex and display dash webkit dash flex. You'll want to add the dash webkit dash flex to ensure compatibility with Safari. Now inside, you'll notice a rule of flex grow one on each of these flex items. This tells the browser that each of these little elements should be the same size. Then you'll also see a rule of align content space around. This tells the browser to distribute the space surrounding each element evenly. Another example of Flexbox in action is on this sample HTML page that I created earlier. This probably looks familiar to everyone. In this page, I used Flexbox to align the title and the text within the header here. You'll see the display of WebKit Flex and the display of Flex in the header. And all I did was add a rule of Flex Grow 1 to the header H1. There's a lot more to Flexbox than what I've included in this brief example. So I've included a link below to a tutorial that goes into the details of using Flexbox in much more depth. So we've gone over quite a few ways one can position HTML elements on a page using CSS. I'm sure you can imagine at this point how complicated and buggy this has the potential to become. Also, keep in mind that different browsers such as Chrome, Firefox, and IE may not position elements the same way. One very important key point to keep in mind when creating your web pages is that well-structured, clean, semantic, and properly organized HTML is much easier to lay out and work with. Start simple and clean. Organize your containers and elements well from the very start, and your front-end work will be much easier and far faster. To address many of the issues with HTML, CSS, page layout, and positioning, Grid systems have been created and are widely used to help make page layout easier, faster, and more streamlined. Twitter Bootstrap, the front-end development framework we'll be using in class, uses a built-in 12-column fluid grid system to do much of the layout work for you. You'll use Bootstrap's grid system by placing specific CSS classes into your HTML and loading a special CSS file that has all of the positioning, padding, and margin rules laid out for you. Bootstrap's grid system is responsive, and grid systems in general are often built to be fluid and responsive. That makes your life a lot easier when it comes to mobile development. And Bootstrap's takes a mobile-first approach. If you'd like to read more, I've included a link below to the Bootstrap site. Okay, we've gone over a lot in this screencast. Stay tuned for CSS Chapter 3, where we will discuss CSS inheritance, specificity, best practices, and a methodological approach to front-end web development.